Ah, thank you all so much for joining. Um, my name is Danielle Boland, and I am a person on a path of recovery and discovery. Super grateful to be here with all of you. Um, today, this was really the most important part of my day and making sure that I was grounded and uh, asked the universe and God to deliver the message that I am supposed to send through to you today. So um, as some of you might know from other 12-step programs, it's kind of like sharing um, your experience, your strength, and, and your hope. So for me, the first part of this is going to be my story to a certain extent. And then the second half is more experience in recovery and um, more of the hope. So um, you can always feel free to reach out to me anytime. I'll send my contact information after um, and more than happy to, to you know, have conversations with any and all of you. Um, this is quite an amazing community. So um, start with my upbringing. Uh, so came from a family, you would say, you know, there were a lot of kids that came from divorced families that would say that we had the perfect family. And um, as you know, like there's no such thing as that. Um, so to give you an idea, uh, what I did find in time was my dad's mom was anorexic. And my dad's dad, um, the mother left and took one of the children and left him behind. So for those of you on this program of discovery, um, you, you probably understand like there starts some intergenerational trauma. And my grandmother, I mean, eating disorders, anything it, like with control is the spectrum of addiction, right? So we either say on this end is the is super hyper controlled and then to this end, it's the efforts. So anything that kind of fits in that is, um, sorry, this is a little distracting there. So anything that fits in that is, is some type of addiction. It's on the spectrum of control. So my mom's parents, um, my, my mom's dad was a very high functioning, uh, drinker and so what happened is even to his death it was never he's an alcoholic or you know he just likes his alcohol even though his mother was a very um bad alcoholic so when we were little there was no talk right of these issues in the family or like history or maybe there's a chance that you could have this too it was more um oh, you know, Grampy's mom was a severe alcoholic and your mind goes to, okay, like the person under the bridge, these sick, really weird people, right, that I could never identify with. So um, I, what came from that is two parents marrying each other that both had some type of dysfunction, right, which is super common, um, becoming enmeshed and possibly somewhat codependent then becoming a um, product of that relationship as someone that only knew relation to be in relation to people in an enmeshed codependent people pleasing kind of way. Um, as some of you may know, Nikki Meyer says that uh, codependent is the disease of the lost self. And to me, that's that whole idea that you hear a lot in addiction, outer reach for inner peace. This thing will validate me, this job will validate me, this person will validate me. Um, and for me, this path of recovery has been a lot of unbecoming those codependent tendencies. Um, I'm very close to my parents today. I want to say that um, I've done uh, all 12 steps, worked with a sponsor and or 12 efforts if, if you um, identify with that more. And I have, I blame them for nothing, nothing. I want to make that clear. I think that the victim mindset can be a very dangerous thing. And for me, it just helps me understand more of where I came from. And so healing is really when you can get to the point of, wow, this was, this was challenging, but I love you. And I understand that you did the best that you could with what you had at that time, right? Everybody is limited to some extent. Um, 
So one of the things I'd say on that is just this idea of how important it is today for families to talk about this stuff, to eliminate the stigma. Um, it's normal. I mean, if you look at the stats, there's some form of addiction, eating disorder. I mean, in so many families, and if not, there's, you know, being brought up in a family like that, where you're para alcoholics, you take on the isms. And I find that everywhere now. So um, it's only when people start to be brought into families of recovery that we can kind of turn that pattern around. Uh, as the third of four girls, I learned very early on um, that accolades brought me attention, which I equated to love. So I, everything that I could do to be, oh, look at Danielle, you know, volunteering for a speech as early as fourth grade at the town hall. Um, and now in recovery, I don't even necessarily enjoy being in the spotlight as much. Um, it was from a place of, of seeking approval. So it's kind of interesting to be able to discern today. Um, I believe I was a love addict and a codependent well before I ever picked up a drink or a drug. I was obsessed with that fairy tale, right? Like this knight in shining armor would swoop me away. And I remember like you know, having a boyfriend in like fourth grade and only in recovery was I able to recall this, like this high that I got from that and, um, you know, ended up kind of chasing that for a good part of my life until I entered into recovery. Uh, freshman year was a turning point for me. So you might notice in my talk, I talk about um, from trauma to authenticity. Um, so as Gabor Matei says, trauma is not what happens to you. It's what happens to the body when something happens to you. And I was a competitive athlete, again, not because I loved it. I thought that, you know, it made other people in my life happy and proud. And I didn't understand that I had a choice, that I didn't have to do it, right? Like so many kids, I mean, we don't necessarily know that we have a choice or we may not feel like we really do. Um, so I played on this ultra competitive softball team at 14. And so picture someone that's so good that you're on this team that's like the best in the state, maybe even in, in all of New England. And I'm in tryouts and a ball hits me on my forehead. So just to tell you that I was already in this habit of leaving my body and I had no idea. Um, so every day this summer, it's not like it just happened once. I would get in a car with a, one of the coaches, his daughter, another girl, and drive an hour to this practice, leaving my body, feeling completely forced, no way out, and going through a, a practice and coming home. And then it would happen with games. Um, if you dropped a ball, you were taken out of the game. And so it might sound like a very mild thing to a lot of people, but what I've understood in the work that I've done is it was that consistent feeling of not being able to escape. And my body, my nervous system kind of became like a, a it was in control of it. it. It had set off kind of this trajectory to program my nervous system that has really affected my entire life. And I would say it's probably the biggest challenge in my life, um, even in recovery. So to make matters worse, that next summer I dated um, somebody who was pretty verbally abusive. Um, and that just goes back to like no sense of self, right? It's, these are common things. I don't know how to, how to step up to that. Um, I was an overachiever in college. Um, even in high school, I was president of my class, president of National Honor Society. I was um, two sport varsity captain. Uh, college, I played soccer. Um, I was so much of a perfectionist thinking that that's how I had to be that I didn't even party that much in college because the biggest thing to me was get a good grade, uh, you know, a good GPA and, and get a good job and make a lot of money. Um, I just didn't know that there were choices. And um, so my first job out of college was in the radio industry. It was fun. It was a lot of liquid lunches. It was a lot of backstage concerts, um, just crazy partying, uh, as you could probably imagine. Um, and right around this time, um, I, it was like two years into that, I did the geographical cure of, wow, I'm drinking too much here and I need to uh, change jobs. And so I went into 
technology sales. Um, I was an executive assistant for a year for a tech company and then moved into sales. At 24, um, around this time, I met like the first really nice guy that I had dated up to this point. Um, and in two years we were married. I had no idea that I had the emotional maturity of a 14 year old um, as we learn in, in, on this path of recovery and was committing my life to this person. Um, no idea that I was a ticking time bomb as far as the way that I, my relationship to alcohol as well and workaholism um, and an unhealthy relationship to food and to people pleasing and perfectionism. Um, so the drinking progressed and the pressure was now in tech sales, um, you know, utilize your being a female to your advantage. Um, at that time, women were actually like groomed out of college to come in, look good and wine and dine men. And we've come a long way from that. But um, that time did a lot of damage to me because again, I wasn't one of those strong women that could just say like, you, you know, like this doesn't work for me. Like that doesn't align with my values. I wasn't clear on those things at that time. Um, a lot of things happen at that time to kind of exacerbate the trauma, right? So drinking situations that I got myself into, such as affairs, um, the high of being with someone, um, or I had a situation where repetitively my boss's boss came into my room and I will leave the, you know, the details to your imagination. Um, so much so that he would get an adjoining room at a bed and breakfast that we would stay at that I couldn't lock the door. Uh, and that was at about 30 years old. Obviously I couldn't share any of this with my husband. Plus I was making poor decisions on my own in my drinking. So it was kind of like you, you, you got yourself into this. Um, and it was at 31 that I think I said to my husband, I think I'm an alcoholic. And he's like, no, you're not. You just want to have fun. Now to talk about the denial, right. In a relationship or some people in, that we love, or if we, our loved ones are struggling, um, he saw me every day. He saw the worst of it. No one else really saw anything. So for him to say that to me, um, it, you know, my instinct was like, oh, maybe I'm not that bad. And I just knew at this point I'd hash it over for, you know, so much time on my own. And I'm like, we need to talk to your dad. His dad now has, I think, like 35 years in recovery. And we went over and his dad said, you are the only one that knows. And um, I was really, really grateful for that. So that was the point at 31, I said, I think I'm an alcoholic. I'd go to meetings, I'd sit in the back, I'd go in and out, I'd listen. And um, one of the things that I say is, you know, thank goodness for years and years of historical recovery that we have now to point back to, right? Like the creators of AA with Bill and Bob, they didn't really know a lot. Um, with that history now and everything that we understand, we are afforded the opportunity to stop the progression very early on, right? Which some of you may know as like a high functioning um, drinker or drug, whatever your, your addiction may be, right? The challenge with that is the going into meetings and comparing versus identifying, right? I am not her. I didn't have kids yet. How would, I wouldn't do that and then drink. Like I'm waiting to have kids until I'm sober, you know, just like that kind of craziness. Um, judging, right? Uh, judgment is, is a big part of the work that I, I have done and continue to do. Um, so I'd go into these meetings and again, just didn't didn't identify, I did more of the comparing. Um, November of, I was 22, 30, sorry, 32 years old. It was the fall. I got the job of a lifetime as a sales director. All I have ever wanted to do is lead a team. And I got the job making um, multiple six figures. Um, and it was a keg in the kitchen, uh, leadership doing cocaine, um, a lot of whining and dining. And I hire this team and I'm like, these kids are in their twenties and I go home. I never drank at work, but I go home and drink a bottle of wine or I go to the bar with the execs, you know, after work. And I'm like, I'm living a lie. And that's not like the mentor and leader that I've ever wanted to be. Um, and so almost a year into the role, 
nothing unique happened. It was another weekend shit show. I went away with a girl that I played sports with as a teenager, not even realizing like that was a trigger for me. And it was just a disastrous weekend. And um, I came home and I said to my husband, I'm going to treatment. He's like, what, what happened? You know? And I just like, it was like in Monopoly, it was like, you're going, do not pass go. Like, you know, whatever you need to do, this is what you're doing. So I, um, I ended up checking myself into a 30 day program. Time said to me, Danielle, you know that I struggle with alcohol, but I mask it with exercise. He said, You go get the help you need, and this job will be here when you get back. They loved me. Um, I again I was I was a people pleaser and um a work addict. So the brunt of the pain from my addiction was on the person that I lived with, um, and and myself, right? Um, so um I went to a 30 day program and 14 days in, I started to, I spoke to one of the VPs who was also a heavy partier. And he said, I wish you didn't tell everyone what happened because the general consensus here is that you overreacted. And that was suspicious. And they had just sent out this thing, a press release saying they were increasing headcount by 18% year over year. And um, four days out of treatment, that same boss that told me that, um, you know, he had a problem and would support me. Um, met with me. I was 30 days sober, 34. And he said, your position's been eliminated. And uh, I was devastated. Um, to make matters worse, the insurance company that I wrote a letter to said, despite your chronic drunk driving, you are not a risk to yourself or others. And therefore you owe us the $15,000 for um, your treatment program. Um, what I will say to you, and I think a theme for me has always been trying to be resilient, right? When things happen in our life, it's like parents and it was like the universe basically being like, okay, step up. Like, what do you do here? Um, I had a bunch of job offers, but for whatever reason, I was sober and going to a lot of meetings and very, you know, probably somewhat spiritually fit, even though I was like mocusy at that time. Um, something said, don't take one of the positions. And um, I ended up becoming a huge advocate at the state house fighting for different, um, I testified quite a few times at the state house around insurance coverage, um, because I was like, I have resources, I have a husband that works, but like, you're supposed to be able to get this help and, and, you know, and, and your company's not supposed to let you go. So um, so I did a lot of those wonderful things that came from what seemed pretty horrible. Um, I did fight the company. And the only reason that I bring that up is because six months sober, I'm sitting at a, one of the biggest law firms in Boston. And um, I'm sitting across from like, you know, five men in suits, like super um, intimidating. And because of this program, even six months sober, I was able to pray and relax and stand in my power for the first time because I knew that everything I was doing was right. Um, so fast forward uh, a year into sobriety and I ended up opening up my own recovery coaching, wellness coaching and intervention organization. Um, and that was and has been amazing. Um, I don't think I ever really let go of kind of the success and like dream job that I felt like I had um, in, you know, in, in the tech world. Um, but, but for the most part, I, I loved helping people on a daily basis. Um, you know, going to doing sober companion work and just some really neat things and, and neat experiences. Um, so that was in year one, year two, my husband wanted to have a child. I wasn't ready. And, um, we went through the process and, um, I had no idea hormonally or the trauma triggers. I, it was not a good time for me. Um, I miscarried and, um, moved out of the house, which what I know now is things all worked out the way they were supposed to. However, I probably, I, I, there was no way to know how unstable I was, even though I was sober. Um, and a lot of it had to do with the hormones, which I'll explain to you in a few minutes why um, it affected me so poorly. 
So um, if you guys know with coaching, um, you're, you're kind of, you're pretty open with your clients. And so I was very open about my history with relationships and the love kind of sex thing and had told a client, you know, about everything that had happened. Um, I was struggling in my marriage. I did not feel like it was a good fit for me. Um, but at some point in the next year while we were separated, he wanted to get back together. And then we went to therapy and he's like, I don't think so. He had received a letter from one of my clients, anonymous, not very healthy, as you can imagine, telling him all sorts of details. Um, and I was devastated for him, not for me at all, but you know, my justification drinking and numbing was as long as he doesn't find out, um, we're good, you know, nobody's hurt here. So that really was a decision to, um, end the marriage and, um, again, not having any idea about how strong these triggers were for me. It was not a good time at all. Chemically. Um, I checked myself into a, um, a program again just like a week um, for mental health and before my third year sober I ended up picking up again and uh, this nobody knew nobody knew until I told them and um, mind you I was running this business right and uh, I've heard it said pardon my swearing but you can't save your ass and your face at the same time right so um I really had to humble myself and go into a meeting and say, um, you know, I drank, uh, I don't care what happens with my job or my career, but I need, you know, to start from here. And what I want to say about this is, um, you know, when people ask me outside of the 12 steps of AA, I have been in recovery for almost nine years. My path of recovery started on May 22nd, 2013. My continuous sobriety was interrupted and in December, I'll have five years. Um, but for me, it's so important to understand and R2O has been wonderful about this. This is a journey. There are so many people who have 30 years without a drink that have nothing like what I want. And I will tell you, I was not aware of my trauma triggers. Um, it was in therapy when my therapist, I told her I could smell the grass in the spring and, and it did something to me. And that's when we started to understand like these layers of trauma. Um, so much so that I'm in a new job and I can be in the freeze response right now for like a full day at a time. Um, and again, it's something that I'm working through, but um, so let me see where did I want to go? So I got back in. Um, during this time, I went on a retreat to um, Costa Rica with R2O. And I thought, ooh, a, a um, flow yoga retreat, right? Having no idea what Kundalini was. And um, went down there and I did the first Kriya. And I thought to myself, this gets to your shit knowing myself that I have to fake it until I make it, that I needed it, but I wouldn't commit to it. I, like a good addict, um, was on my computer in one of the sessions there signing up for teacher training back in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. And so I went through the pretty rigorous 200 hour Kundalini yoga training, um, was amazing. And uh, just, you know, I mean, if you're here, you understand the value of yoga and meditation on the nervous system and on our growth and spirituality. Um, I also went to India um, with Tommy and, and team and just wonderful friendships. You know, for the first time in my life in recovery, I wanted to build real relationships. I didn't just want to be like the person sitting next to someone at the bar, you know, these superficial relationships. Um, I've met more genuine, honest people who are interested in growing, you know, like-minded. It's, it's been such a gift. Um, then I think it was 2018, the summer of 2018, and uh, I went to Kripalu with Tommy, and I just said, I'm in my head, and what do I do? And he's like, you need to do a uh, 40-day um, Aquarian sadhana, which for those of you that don't know, it's pretty intense. It's uh, two and a half hours. I was running my own business and sober, I could do it. 
So um, I'm halfway through and I injured myself at the gym and I'm like my neck and um, I went to get an MRI and I get a call and they said to me, well, yeah, you have two herniated discs, but we also found a mass in your neck. I'm like, what? You know, I'm a yogi, I'm sober, I eat pretty clean. Like what, what is going on? I don't drink, like this doesn't happen to people like me. Um, and what ended up happening is I was diagnosed with uh, metastatic thyroid cancer. Um, it had spread to nine of my lymph nodes and was a millimeter from my bloodstream. So luckily it is a very um, curable cancer if you uh, catch it early enough and that it hasn't spread. But what's interesting is they figured that it was in me since my twenties. So when I was on those hormones to get pregnant, part of the thought is that's why it was so bad for me and why I couldn't get pregnant um, because I was so off. So um, that was a really difficult time. You know, I was in a relationship. I kind of find, I say it was like my like learning relationship um, in sobriety. He was sober and I'm grateful for that time because he was very supportive and, um, you know, I needed a lot of help. I couldn't always work. And, um, and it was just, it was a hard time, but that time helped me with my body. It helped me with appreciating my body. Oh um, my gosh, like this one body and I wanted you to be thinner and I wanted this to be bigger or smaller. And it's like, I love you. I'm so grateful to have you. And these things that I would have never understood until I was diagnosed and heard the C word. Um, it also helped me around, you know, I remember just saying to Tommy once, I'm always going to struggle with eating. And he laughed at me and it was wonderful because someone did that to me in my twenties when I said I was going to always struggle with drinking. It's like, they know, right. And, uh, part of when I was going through the cancer treatments, um, I was doing water fasting with Dr. Nick, um, and just learned more of like there's no good or bad foods. It's like the foods that energize me and, and feed me versus the foods that deplete me. Right. And that's just a big part of my life now is like what feeds me versus what, what depletes me energetically people, um, what's on TV. Again, I'm not perfect with it when I'm scrolling through the internet. Um, so let me see. I mean, this is I'm kind of at the end here. Um, a week after I finished my treatment, I lost my dog and that was devastating. I felt like he was this angel with me for 12 years, um, through, you know, miscarriage, divorce, addiction, um, relapse, cancer, everything. And, uh, so it kind of seemed like this closing of the chapters to me. Um, and in that year I ended up my partner and I, we broke up. And in that time, another layer of the onion, I understood about abandonment issues, had never really heard of it. Why would I have those issues? Um, tied in with the trauma and, um, you know, this deep fear of being left alone. Uh, was able to do some work by Diane Poole Heller, a lot of work on my own and super grateful for that as well. You know, grateful, thank you for the joys and the challenges of my life. Um, so what does life look like today? Well, I still have my coaching business, but um, I probably out of fear, I went back into the tech world and I know it sounds crazy, but I believe that God kind of felt like there was this loop that wasn't closed. Um, it's been very difficult for me right now. Um, because it is triggering kind of where I was in 2013 when I left um, a lot of that space, right? That my nervous system's like, wait, this isn't then. Um, and just a lot of the being new and you were out for eight years and what if you, you know, had stayed, look where you'd be, you know, and just working through all of that. Um, what does good recovery look like to me today? I'm a huge fan of emotional sobriety. I will say it a million times over, I'm just someone that would probably rather be drinking in my life than, um, than be sober without emotional sobriety. So um, I am doing a 40 day sadhana right now. Um, not always perfect with those, but when I commit to a 40 day, I can commit to it. Um, Meditation, yoga, fitness has become a huge thing in my life just for the anxiety, if nothing else. Um, 
that's another thing that I, when I got sober because of the sports, I was like, I'm never going to want to work out. And, um, something I have clients do, I wrote a letter to myself, dear Danielle, it's 2014, a year from now, and you'll never believe what your life looks like. And you love working out. And, and guess what? I mean, maybe it didn't happen in the next year, but it's 2021. And I love working out for the most part. Um, prayer is a huge part of my life, surrounding myself with positive energy. And, and I do believe that that comes from doing the work and the next right thing. Um, I'm getting ready to freeze my eggs to possibly bring a child into the world in the next year. Um, here's the thing, no matter what, the coolest thing about where I am in my life right now is I am the woman that little me would have looked up to. This life would have never come to me if I did not enter the path of recovery and discovery. It just wouldn't have. I would have been that person that regretted on my deathbed. And the way I live my life now is I am not going to sit there and wish I didn't try or I didn't do it. I just knew like this was me. This was authentic me. And um, there's something to be said about that. You know, when we go out after work uh, now and people are out drinking and and um, the, I'm, I always was envious of the person that could just go home and wake up early and work really hard. And maybe that's not for everyone, but that was me. And so that's that piece of authenticity. And, you know, I continue to peel away some of these, I was explaining it on a, our 2 meeting yesterday, and I'll close with this, you know, um, if you've ever, um, Joseph Campbell, and, and one of the his finding Joe is, like the old Buddha statue with the mud on it. And the they start to peel, pit, chip away and there's gold under there. And to me, that's all of us, right? We come in as this like perfect spirit. And over time, the mud comes on. It's not like becoming something else. Like we already are. And it's about this work of recovery, the peeling of the layers or the scraping of the mud. And I couldn't ask to be on... Um, you know, a different path. I, it just, it wouldn't work for me at this point in my life. So I hope I've covered everything. Thank you all so much for listening to me. Um, and I believe we do have time for uh, some Q and A if people want to message anything. Feel free to type in the chat if you um, have any questions, I'd love to stay on. And if anybody does want to, let me just, I'll put my email here. If you do want to uh, reach out, oh, Damara has a hand raised. Can um, people come in? I'm not sure. I'm just going to look something up here. Okay. Um, okay. So some people can talk about this more than me. Um, but, you know, can you talk about emotional sobriety? And I don't know the exact letter, um, Bill and Bob, but there was a time where they were just like starting to understand this. Um, and so they started to explore this idea of emotional sobriety. And I wanted to just look something up really quickly here. So the idea of emotional sobriety is um, there's some wonderful people. I think it's R2O, right? It's about really, it's not like, oh, I put down alcohol, but I'm gonna go eat donuts and drink like 10 coffees, right? It's like, how do I get to be emotionally and, and, and physically conscious and present in my life every day? And how do I get to choose love over fear? And how do I get to um, change my perspective? And so these are some of the things around it. Um, Dr. Alan Berger is another amazing pioneer around emotional sobriety, but does that make sense? If you guys know people in 12 step program and it works for them, right? Recovery looks different to different people. Um, but it's basically like, for me, 
thriving. That's why R2O spoke so much to me, right? It's, it's thriving um, versus just, yeah, I'm sober. Like I didn't do this for that. My life wasn't like, it was a shit show, but you know, it wasn't so horrible um, before that, like, you know, I don't want to live a boring life now. I really want to thrive in my life. So let me see, there were some. The line from Gabor Mate, I love this. And I believe that part of my mission is to continue to speak about this because I don't think, I have only begun to understand nine years into this, how much the trauma, you know, like the doctor sent to me yesterday, like my codes and it's like PTSD. I don't say I have PTSD because like I wasn't a vet or, you know, there was definitely sexual things, but it's really, really significant PTSD. And um, I don't talk about it, right? Because it wasn't this crazy car accident or like, you know, somebody died in front of me. And, and I think it's really important because most of us in recovery um, have some level of that fight or flight freeze in their body at times, right? And so what Gabor Mate said is, Trauma is not what happens to you. It's what happens to the body when something happens to you. So that's it, it, right? My body doesn't know. Like, I will tell you the reaction of PTSD I have with like men in authority right now, um, back in the corporate world, it, I might as well have been at a in, like near a bomb. That's what my body feels like is happening. So again, you know, the, the nervous system doesn't know the situations, it, it like the specifics, but it, it reads like, am I in danger? And then that feeling of being locked into it, um, situations that are repetitive or that you feel like you can't escape. So I hope that answers that. Cool, I'll, last call for Q and A. Oh, what is your self-care routine? I missed this. And do you still attend meetings? So yes. So what I would say is it's like a recovery pie to me. Um, AA got me sober. I need, for me, I go to AA to remember why I don't, that I can't drink, right? Because it's been very easy over time to be like, my life's good. But if I want to keep that emotional sobriety and thrive in my life, I just can't drink. Um, so I go, I would say on average, like a meeting a week. Part of that for me is having a partner that is also in recovery. I, it's too big a part of my life that I'm not with someone that shares that with me. And it also makes it easier. Um, I know that that's not possible for everyone. Um, so self-care routine, I'm just very self-aware. I know what I need, right? I was that person that loved like being in the center of attention or chaos or loud and go, go. And I remember being at a yoga festival with Tommy a few years ago. And I was just like, I don't know what's wrong. I, I don't want to be with everybody. And he was laughing. He's like, I think it's wonderful. He's like, you're, you're, you're becoming you. And the reality is I love living life. I love experiencing things, but I need a lot of downtime. Um, my space is very important to me. I try to have like, I'm redoing my office. It's going to be very spa-like, um, even though I'm going to be in, in tech sales. Um, the spa that's soothing, again, things for my nervous system, the gym, yoga, meditation. So the thing I want to say about sadhana, why I said that to you guys, I truly believe that that 40-day Aquarian sadhana is why I was able to find out about the cancer, like that intuition and then like bringing it to light. So once I went through that and it, it was just, you know, could draw that line, it, it did not seem to make sense to me to like ever abandon that again. I'm not sure what you all think, but to me, I always say that meditation is like the plug, right? To the universe. And so that there's a part of us that kind of knows which way we're supposed to go or which way we're being guided. But when you plug in, it becomes a lot easier to make those decisions. Um, and food for me, I love food. I, I love it. I'm not going to say I don't love unhealthy food, but it becomes not worth it to me. Um, sugar makes me anxious. Sugar makes me foggy, especially where I don't have a thyroid now. Um, so I will cheat. And then I'm able to uh, kind of get back into a routine. I, since doing the fasting with Dr. Nick, um, I find that um, 
intermittent fasting works wonderfully for me. So um, in an ideal world, I'll eat eight to four and then I don't eat any other time. I sleep better, I have more energy, I'm eating less food, which I've learned that I, 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 I don't require as much food. Um, so yes, I am not able to see if there was another question here. Let me see if I pinned it by accident. Can anybody see that? Shoot, oh, there it is, it was hiding. Okay, um, last thing I can I'll answer, well, it doesn't have to be the last one, but um, please talk more about relapse and how you know if you're flirting with danger. Um, so basically, there was this awesome thing I got in treatment and I wish I could find it. I used to give it to clients, but it was like a hundred signs that you're like at risk for, for relapse. And it's all these things that we know by the time you pick up that drink or drug or whatever, I mean, it was a month or whatever in the making, as far as I'm concerned, probably longer. Right. So for me, I need to remember, um, what it was like not to be stuck in the shame, but like, if I'm at a meeting, I'm like, God, I don't, I don't want to go back there. I love my life. Like, you know, for the most part, I, I and, um, I guess my thing is if you're concerned that you're flirting with danger, then you're probably flirting with danger, right? It's, if you have some time sober, that intuition is speaking to you. You know, we learn in early recovery, like don't listen at it, like take the cotton out of your ears and put it in your mouth and, you know, not to listen to yourself. Well, that's fine in the beginning, but the wonderful, beautiful thing about recovery is that like, we get to a point where like, yes, you can check with other people for guidance, but, but sober, healthy, thriving, you probably knows you better than anyone. So if you have that, um, kind of gut feeling, then it's just more, right? What gives me more spirituality? What aligns me more with the God of my understanding? So whether it's nature, whether it's certain people, I would say who you spend your time with, um, just being reminded about, about recovery. These are all really um, important things. So, um, oh, those are good. What was your lowest low? So, I mean, when I relapsed, I was suicidal. Um, again, had no idea about trauma, really, like this whole PTSD thing. And I believe that it, it was either drink or kill myself. So for me, that was like a really low, low. And I don't know about you guys, but there were a lot of lows, nothing happening, right? I didn't get the DUI, I got out of it because my husband was a firefighter, but just that waking up with deep, deep shame, right? Like I did it again. This is what I say to my clients, like, I wish I drank last night, says no one ever, ever, right? Or just like, I wish I didn't just go to the gym or I wish I didn't go to that meeting. Um, we don't say that because like, it just, that waking up me like you did it again because you know, Nikki Myers talks a lot about confidence and self-esteem. And the biggest thing is keeping promises that you make to yourself. Well, for how long could I not? And so for me, the biggest low was over and over again, like betraying my own spirit and not keeping those promises. Um, how to deal with family that has not chosen sobriety at family events. So um, I always bring my own car um, to a lot of events, make sure I have an exit. But what I will tell you is my, my family drinks pretty, pretty heavily. And uh, I remember when we went into the family meeting, I was like, you guys, this means like, if you want me at events right now, like you need to not drink. And it was like, you know, I was out of treatment two days and my dad was like, so how's everybody feel not drinking? It was like, oh my God. And, and then like a week later, everyone was back to it. I wasn't telling them they didn't have to drink, but if they wanted me around, I didn't want to be around it. So that was the beginning of boundary work for me was the first year. I went to a wedding and I went and sat in the car. Um, I learned how to say no. And it was wonderful because it was like, I had to protect my sobriety. And so all of a sudden it was like, someone's telling me I have to do this to stay sober. It became okay for me to be able to say no. Um, and I will tell you that being in the recovery field, uh, it's just sad for me. This is why I don't enjoy like concerts as much or being at parties for a long period. Sometimes it doesn't phase me, but like, I'm like, they're going home hungover and there's wreckage, right? Like there's, there's just, it's the sadness behind it for me. Um, 
So with family, it just depends. Some days I'm fine and it doesn't phase me nine years into this. And when I'm not in a great place in my life and they're drinking, I'm like, I don't really want to be around it today. So I hope that helps. I think that's it. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much.